Hey, hello, how are you? This is a show for everyone else. Instead of going after top 1% of the world, we dedicate this podcast to celebrate the lives of the unsung heroes and self-made artists. It's really that act of transcreation that you are putting together when you are going from one language to another. You're not just translating, but you are taking a little bit of freedom of changing the message to where it really resonates without taking anything away from the essence. We all have this reading detector. You know who is reading and who is not. So you want to give them what they want, which is that connection with you. It is very different to write for an audience that is going to be reading versus an audience that is going to, going to be listening. So you have to write, quote unquote, for the ear. I really enjoyed meeting foreign people and showing them Mexico. So that part of becoming some sort of an ambassador to my country, to this day, I love and cherish. My professional life when I was an employee, it was always focused on marketing, public relations, advertising, international relations, and international trade. I always saw each one of those as a separate one until I got this lightning moment that put all those dots together, that connected all those dots and said, yes, I can definitely do that. Being able to transmit messages from one language to another in a way that brings them results, in a way that gets them what it is that they want to transmit with that message, and in a way that enables me to help touch hearts and move lives. Hey guys, what's up? This is Fei Wu and welcome to another episode of the Face World podcast. Today I have Helena Escalante joining me. Helena and I met through Elton BA 8. Elton BA is from Seth Godin, an incredible online MBA experience. I really couldn't say enough about it. And it was the best investment I made in 2017. Helena and I were in several cohorts together. Two out of the four weeks when we spent hours and hours together with people from around the world each week. Helena is a fireball full of positive energy. You really can't help feeling uh, upbeat and life is good when you're around her. So after l MBA, we kept in touch through Gustavo Serafini's weekly mastermind group where Helena more fully unveiled herself, her full potential, and her helpful nature as a colleague and as a friend. Just a few months ago, she started her blog, Entre Guru. So think about entrepreneur and guru, two words mushed together. She was passionate about the idea. So what is it about is that you spend five minutes a day reading her blog, which can also be emailed to you, um, and she shares something that will help you in business and in life. Though she's always game to offer you help, I realized I knew very little about her, her upbringing, her family dynamics, and where the heck does she get all the information and ideas from? Clearly, she reads a lot. So it was a great opportunity for me to invite her to join me on the podcast. Instead of talking more about her hypothetically, what I love about her block today as I'm recording this um, is that she talks about giving versus receiving. Specifically, think about, are you a good receiver? We've all heard that it's better to give than to receive. We bought into it and became givers, which is wonderful, but we also became very bad receivers. Giving and receiving are two sides of the same coin. Whoever decided that it's better to give than to receive was simply bad at math. For every giver, there must be a receiver. And for every receiver, there must be a giver. Why do I find this resonating? Because I was, and I'm still sort of not a great receiver. 
I think being brought up in China has something to do with it because culturally, we were taught not to accept anything, especially when we are in somebody else's home. I was taught to say no to water, to food, to snacks. Even when I was thirsty and hungry, it was the polite way, as my grandma told me. Just a few years ago, I learned to say yes to things. Yes, I need that. Yes, I would appreciate if you could. It was like learning a third language. What I also love about Helena's approach is she gives you an action item today. For example, after reading this post, "Are you a good receiver?" she suggests that you give yourself a gift that, in the past, you wouldn't even have considered. You can buy something if you want, but if you don't, it doesn't have to be a physical thing. It could be about taking some time out of your busy schedule to walk in nature, or take a long bath, or to give yourself a free evening by not cleaning the kitchen, but instead using that time to read your favorite book. So this is your opportunity to get to know Helena as it was for me. She's your guru next door, who's here to lighten your day just a little bit. If you like this format, if you like what you're about to hear, I would mega appreciate that you hit the subscribe button. New episodes are released. Every Thursday, and、um, yeah. Without further ado, here comes Helena Escalante. How many episodes have you recorded so far with other podcasters? Well, I have to tell you though,、uh, I have. Oh my God! Off the top of my head, I don't know. It's it's several, definitely. But I have decided just recently to change the whole format. So, well, as you know, I have started my blog, Entre Gurus, which delivers one idea a day from the best book of the top entrepreneurship gurus. And this is my promise that you can read it and benefit from it in less than five minutes. And my podcasts were wonderful, but the format was being too long. I was not being congruent with what I was promising. So, because we're all busy, and because we still want to keep up with everything, I decided to change the format. And so, what I'm going to do is deliver same thing: one idea a day in less than five minutes. And then the author interviews are going to come as a bonus. During the weekends, so that's what I that's what I changed instead of the whole other idea, which is fantastic. But for the time being, it's just part. So I remember last during our last connection, I had mentioned just how high quality your blog posts are, and I'm still getting them every day. I had always I had wanted to hear from you for you to actually just read that blog post, but obviously your idea is probably a little more advanced and way more prepared than that is. But I would be happy even you just. Read that story or read your own writing to me. Oh my God! Well, thank you, thank you so much. It makes my heart sink to hear that you like it, definitely. But I think this could be another way of bringing value to entrepreneurs and professionals everywhere. But all and also, it's going to be both in English and in Spanish. Not 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 in the same not in the same block, if you may. So I'm going to have the podcast in English and then the podcast in Spanish, so that. In the Spanish-speaking world, they can also hear it. Are you going to have two separate podcasts, like two different、uh, cover arts and like two different RSS feed, or the same? It's going to be technically the same. However, it's going to change simply that it's going to be entre gurus and español. Ah, so. It's going to be the same, the exact same podcast translated into Spanish, so that they can be simultaneous. But they're going to be two different RSS feeds, two different everything, so that they, I'm trying not to mix because those. Members of the audience that only speak English would have no interest in that, and I don't want to take away your their time, which is so valuable. And same with the Spanish-speaking audience that doesn't speak English; they don't necessarily need to go through that.、Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm trying to separate as much as I can to give them each what they need. Isn't that smart? Because the work has already been done, but I mean, at the same time, right? There's still more work because I know 
I, I try to write the same article in Chinese and in English, and the translation isn't super direct, at least for those two languages. You do have to modify your approach, even then the tone, right, a little bit too, so you can relate to um, readers who speak that language. And I, I once talked about languages with my other guests because I do have a very big variety of guests whose first language isn't English. And I find that fascinating. And uh, one of them told me that so much of it, it's a, it's a visceral connection. When you speak the language, it's not just the sound you make, but also how that language is making you feel and making you think differently. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And one of the things that I love is this term called transcreation, which is the translation that is used for marketing, advertising, public relations, or or let's just say promotional purposes, that you're not just translating, but you are taking a little bit of freedom of changing the message to where it really resonates without taking anything away from the essence. So it's it's really that act of transcreation that you are putting together when you are going from one language to another. Mm-hmm. That's super exciting. Um, Right. We've been talking about your show since uh, last year and I've been super, you know, looking forward to it. And I'm sure you feel the same way. I know I have so much to talk to you about, but before we move away from podcasting and, and all this is kind of intertwined anyway, what are some of the things that you learned, the things you wish you knew when you first got started with the podcasting journey? Absolutely. I don't even know where to start because I think what that question leads me to answer you that I need more fingers than I have to be able to answer that whole thing completely. But let's just start with the first and foremost, the software. I didn't know anything about this. So just to dive into the microphones, the different softwares, how to record, how to do that. So in a sense, it's not difficult. It seems quite challenging at the beginning because it's something like anything you start when you don't know, you just look in awe as to what it is. But little by little, thank goodness for online demos. Thank goodness for my husband who has been working for TV for a thousand years. Thank goodness for all of these wonderful people who have lent a hand, including you, to to share what you know. Your podcasting group is fantastic. So it's this incredible community, I guess, that has led me to understand how the how the hard part works. And then in terms of the soft skills, I have really come to believe that one of the best things that you can do is not sound canned, not sound like you're reading, but and that also it is very different to write for an audience that is going to be reading versus an audience that is going to going to be listening. So you have to write, quote unquote, for the ear. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. So I love where you're going with this. And I've learned so many different lessons and I still listen to my show and, you know, my guests all very happy with the results. Still, I catch myself doing something, especially during recording. And it's it's best not to do so much of that because then it distracts you from being the host or being the guest. How do you write for the ears? Like what are some concrete examples or things that are top of mind for you? Sure. Well, in my particular experience, I've been very lucky because I have done voiceover for a number of years. So part of the work that I do is, again, to translate from English into Spanish and then put that into script form. So actually, the very best thing that you can do once you've written something is actually pick it up and read it aloud. And that way you will know what sounds well and what doesn't. That is in my experience, the very best thing, simply because you're listening to yourself or give it to someone else and have that person read it to you or have you read it, read it to someone else. That's probably the best way that you can do something. In, it, obviously, that is something if you can do it in a short amount of time. If you're doing something such as an audiobook or something else, it really depends on the intention, I think, as to how to write for the ear. But a podcast or something that is going to be recorded, I think it comes best if you just do it naturally. And thank goodness for the magic of 
editing, you can, even if you think it's great as you're going and as you're recording, you can always have the option of recording on top of it. That's a great advice because, I mean, I try to read some of the blog posts because, and not every piece, but because I spend so much time writing them, revisions, this and that, I felt like it's a waste if I don't turn that into what I call the mini episode where people know it's only only takes five, 10 minutes for me to read a blog post and then they can listen to it and there's no further obligation. And I find it fascinating, like you said, the way that we would write to readers versus the way we would write to listeners are so different viscerally, fundamentally, that I feel different. A sentence that could be completely grammatically correct or say that if you were to take an English class, you get a good grade, you're trying to sound smart, that <laughs> they don't come out right when you read them. There's no emotion. It sounds canned. It sounds cold and disconnected. So well, another thing that is important is we all have this reading detector. You know who is reading and who is not. So you want to give them what they want, which is that connection with you. Uh, in a sense, you can compare it to what, you know, one of the mo modern world maladies, which is death by PowerPoint. How many of us have been in a meeting where the speaker just reads the PowerPoint? If you wanted to read, you could perfectly do it, right? Because you very likely will have the deck or will have it afterwards. What you want is that connection from the speaker. What you want is what the speaker has to tell you. And I think that in podcasting is the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. It's very true. So the format and the way you're going to organize uh, your podcast may still evolve. So whatever we talk about now, maybe that's just the beginning of Helena's uh, show. But, you know, are you thinking, are you planning on writing for it for the ear and then record it based on the script? Are you thinking about a bullet point approach where you're going to just improv along the way? Well, here's what I am doing so far. I love brainstorming and brain writing and brain mapping. So with a combination of those three, the first one, if I get together with someone and we can brainstorm together, that's fantastic. Or if I can just do some brain writing, which is sitting down and writing as fast as I can, as many ideas that pour out in a certain amount of time, I can do that because that gives me ideas and that gives me topics. And then once I have those ideas or those topics, I can go into a brain map and really map them out. Once I have those points, I can just naturally use them as guidelines and then just talk about them. And that way it won't sound like it's like if I'm reading. I don't know that I would necessarily rewrite the whole thing because someone wants to read it, it'll be there. But I, I want to give it that auditory quality that will hopefully make someone engaged and give them, bottom line, this eureka moment, this aha moment that'll prompt them into action. Very cool. So for people who are not as familiar with brain writing and brain mapping, could you give us a, a brief description of what they mean, how they, they can go about exploring that? Oh, absolutely. Well, I think we're all familiar. Let me backtrack a little bit and start with brainstorming. What happens well, brainstorming, for those that are not familiar, is simply getting a group of people together so that they can all toss out ideas on whatever issue, you're, whether you want to solve something, whether you want to start something, whether you want to innovate, whatever the issue is, you get a bunch of people together and they just, quote unquote, make it rain idea. So that's the brainstorm part. And then we'll add to that. It usually starts with somebody facilitating with a single marker on the whiteboard. And some people just take a nap. Some people contribute, or could be the only contributor in that group. So it feels unbalanced and sometimes a little canned and forced, right? So, And that is exactly what happens with brainstorming, that sometimes there is someone, there's the leader in the room or someone that just takes over. Or by virtue of it being so such a fantastic idea that comes out first, everybody becomes fixated into that and therefore no more good ideas emerge. And that is something that is, I, I love it. It's called groupthink that, you know, the group is stuck. And by virtue of the whole group thinking the same thing, you can't move forward, which I think is very funny. But anyway, so that's one of the cons about brainstorming. But 
one of the ways in which you can make it much better is by this other technique that is called brain writing. And brain writing is setting a finite amount of time, I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes, so that everyone in silence can write down their ideas. And then you either offer those ideas up or someone writes them down, or you just simply post them on a wall, and then people vote on those ideas. That way, no idea is lost, and all of them count at the same time. Of course, not all of them will be viable, not all of them will be the best ideas, but from that enormous pool of ideas, you can definitely select the few ones that have merit. And okay, so that's two ways of producing a lot of different ideas. And then the brain mapping is really just a fantastic method, if I may say so. You you can do it. There's software for that. There are some there are some free online brain mapping sites that you can download. There are a few paid ones, but you can do it with something as simple as pen and paper. Start in the center with your idea. So put a little circle and then from there, start tracing out or start drawing branches with one additional point each. So if we were going to talk about, let's say, oh my goodness, I don't know, birthday cake, you're planning a birthday party for someone, right? So in the in the center is Faye's birthday. So one branch goes out and says, birthday cake. And then from there, you have three points, chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, or whatever you want, right? And then another branch says, find venue. And then you get, a few, under that, you get some sub points for the different venues that you have. And then you draw another branch that says, by gift, and then you make your sub points there. So that way you have in a visual representation what it is that you are trying to put together, and it helps a lot. I'm a very visual learner and doer, so that way it helps me enormously. And as I move forward sometimes with projects, or again, with these set of podcasts I'm going to be producing, it's going to be very helpful to just take the ideas from there and talk about those different points without necessarily reading a script. Hi there, this is Fei Wu, and you are listening to the Face World Podcast. Joining me today is Helena Escalante, writer behind the blog entregurus.com that brings you one idea every day from the greatest entrepreneurship gurus that you can read in under five minutes. I think that's also a fantastic idea for structuring uh, the recording too, as in this type of interview recording. Because at the beginning, when I started three and a half years ago, it was like everybody else. I had a list of questions. I want to go through them all. I try to organize them and in a way predict how the conversation is going to go. And you're always not in a way wrong, but you can't really predict. And then you become less of an active listener. So you stop listening to the responses. And so for me, I think naturally how it evolved was in a way a brain writing exercise that I use these branches, like you said, uh, as the guest and taking me to all of these mysterious places, I simply make a quick note and then I will look down my paper if needed. I'll go to and travel to these the branches, but without thinking, oh, I have to go from there and necessarily to cover all these branches, but maybe I'll just focus on two to three areas and let them tell me the full story rather than rushing them, you know, getting to the answer. It's almost like a punch list and then just keep going to the next topic and the one after that. Well, I like that. And I'll, I completely agree with you because it enables you to see the whole picture as opposed to the way we write in English is linearly, right? You go from left to right, up from the top to the bottom. So if you're writing an outline or something, you necessarily have to go through there. But if you have the whole picture in front of you, then you're able to jump to those more important points or make some connections that otherwise you may not have seen before. Mm -hmm. Very true. You, uh, you know, you and I, have been lucky enough to be in the same cohorts when we took uh, l MBA. One of the reasons I didn't want to overstudy and prepare this conversation is because I feel like I already know you so well. And right before the session, I started to realize I actually don't know 
too much about you, especially your origin stories and your upbringing. And some of the listeners already may be wondering about that. And I find it fascinating with the fact that you love reading, you love writing, and we need to talk about your brand new blog with your all your ideas, is the fact that English may not even be your first language. So could you tell me about your upbringing? Where, where did you grow up and when did you um, move to the U.S.? Happy, happy to do that. Well, I was born and raised in Mexico City in a family of translators. So from a very young age, even though Spanish is my native language, my parents wanted all of us siblings to learn more languages than just Spanish. So they enrolled us in English classes. So I grew up almost with English all my life. And because Mexico is so close to the United States, most of our vacations were in some place in the United States. So that enabled us to, that enabled us to practice. Uh, we also saw a lot of English TV. My parents would also buy us a lot of children's books in English. So they really wanted us to learn a different language. And that's how I came to learn English. And my mother, my, both of my parents were very entrepreneurial and they have to this date, a translation agency that trans, what started as a translation agency changed later. Not They didn't depart from the translation, but they added international consulting for entrepreneurs or for businesses who wanted to enter the Mexican market and just didn't know how to. And so I started helping with that and I fell in love with that. Oh, wow. So how old were you at the time when you were helping them out? Oh, well, I was very young, really, about 13, 14, as, as young as that. What did you uh, do to help them? I, I I need to dissect some parts of the story. It's just too interesting to know. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I did whatever they had me do that, that a 13 and 14-year-old could do. For instance, I could, well, I learned how to edit. I learned how to spell check. I learned how to transcribe. I learned how to do a lot of different things that were helpful at the time because uh, personal computers were not to be found in the scene for a few more years. And uh, let's see. Well, there, there, it was just a different, it was just a different setting and it was a different market too, because then again, this is Mexico City and we did not have all the technology that existed in the United States yet because the markets at some point were closed. So they had to do with whatever they had, period. So anyway, I was I was helping them, which at the time I hated because that meant that I could not go with my friends and play, right? That I had to help. How many siblings do you have, by the way? I have, well, we're four I have one younger sister that still lives in Mexico than I who live here in the United States. I have one older brother, the one immediately above me that lives in London, and then the oldest one who lives also in New York. Oh, wow. It's, uh, I was just wondering how much help your parents are getting from just the kids. And, uh, and then do they also, do they also have employees as well? Um, other than you guys for translation? Yes. Oh no, definitely. Definitely. No, they had employees, they had assistants, they had, they, they really had it all set up in a very nice way. They wanted us to learn the business and they wanted us to learn the value, I think of helping and earning money. So that's why they would put us to help. I always ask about origin stories and I typically ask people what they were doing or interested in doing when they were 10 or 11 years old because you're old enough to remember yet not so young that some of the things are just random or that you didn't quite focus on because you're too young. So what you just described now kind of painted this picture and I don't want to over interpret like your upbringing to what you're doing now, but there's certainly a lot of connections to your writing, your reading, and and just your love for knowledge. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. I get it all from my parents. My dad was probably the biggest bookworm I've ever met. He would read anything and everything he could get his hands on. And he could talk to you about any topic with a certain amount of knowledge that made him not not an expert in everything by any means, but very, very well-rounded. And then my mom had this, to this date, insatiable knowledge for learning, for finding, for doing new things, for running a business, for she really is my hero. Oh, wow. Yeah, I do remember you talk about your mom and 
I think raising a, a family for your parents and then having more than a full-time, you know, entrepreneurial business, was this un unusual for Mexico City? I mean, absolutely. Right? Very, very unusual. So I, I know I, I want to learn how you transitioned into the U.S., but I still have a question lingering, which is um, because they were doing something so unusual, which has a very positive impact on you, I'm sure your siblings as well. How did it make you feel growing up? Because you maybe hang out with friends whose parents did something completely different, you know, whether I have a steady income or they would travel to work all day. And, you know, like what, what was it like for you guys? Well, it. It definitely was different, but that's that's where it stopped. It was never a comparison as to whether it was better or not. It simply was. Yes, my mom was with a bus full of executives taking them to these different industries in Mexico, showing them places, telling them about the Mexican market. And some other mothers may have been taking their daughters to ballet, for instance. We didn't have that, but we had something else that was not, again, n different. It was just not a way in which I could compare. And I've never felt that it was either, again, better or worse. It simply was. And in a sense, the more I grew into it, the more I liked it, even as a child, even as a teenager. I was born into this. Mm -hmm. So my parents, I think, started the company the year prior one year before I was born. So I was really born into this. And so I never knew any, anything different, really. I, because I remember when they had, for instance, they, they needed a translation into Hebrew and I was playing with the typewriting machine because instead of the roller going from the right to the left and you hitting it to start the new line, it would go the other way around. So that to me was like the biggest source of fun that I could encounter, right? But it it really made for a very interesting life and very cool, let's say, source of toys that were not necessarily toys. For instance, I'll just tell you one cute story. I was the first kid in school that brought liquid paper to help with mistakes on the pages. And so I, you know, when I brought that to school, everybody was like, oh my God, what, how cool, what is it? How can I get my hands on some of that? I want to buy some. So anyway, uh, I was also the first kid who turned in a paper in a personal computer was because obviously this was when my, my parents obviously needed the latest technology for their business. So when they got the first computer, very few other people have it. So it, it was always very cool to see that because I was just, you know, in a sense, tossed into it. Yeah, that's like a Bill Gates story. Like Bill Gates also was one of the first, I mean, he's much older, but I mean, it was even more rare back then. And it was kind of a privilege for, for him because his parents provided that opportunity to him. Well, in a sense, you're right, because it. I don't know how to be other than grateful for that. Yes, th there were times in which I wish I didn't work because something was happening or my friends were getting together or something. But in a sense, overall, I think I really, really enjoyed the work. And then I really, really enjoyed once I was older and I was helping with the with the consulting and the international relations part of it. I really enjoyed meeting foreign people and showing them Mexico. So that part of becoming some sort of an ambassador to my country to this day, I love and cherish. So what brought you to the U.S.? Well, I came to school. I came to college when actually, let me tie this into the story that I was relating. When I started helping with the international relations part of the company, I started getting more and more involved in helping U.S. businessmen enter the Mexican market. And I fell in love with that because I really enjoyed being exposed to all of these business ideas that they were bringing into Mexico, all of these products, all of, uh, all of this that was so new, so innovative and so cool, right? Because I would, by then, I would serve as an interpreter. So I would go 
with them to meetings and I would be the back and forth between the Mexican businessmen and the American businessmen who were trying to get to agree on whatever deal was happening. So with that in mind, I thought, hmm, this could be a very cool thing. So by virtue of me being exposed to all of these ideas, I thought, well, let me see if I can get a shot and go to a school in the United States. And I was lucky enough to go to the University of Texas at Austin that has one of the best programs for Latin American studies, which is what I ended up majoring in, Latin American studies and history. But I did also a little minor in marketing and business simply because I really wanted to have that. And after I graduated, I already had a job. And well, the rest is history. I I stayed because I already had, again, a job that I thought "Mm, this could be great for me. This will give me great experience if I can stay here for a little bit. But then that little bit turned into life and I never went back. So I do go back. That's not to say I go back to visit and I love it. And when I started my company, then of course I would go down on business, but I have never gone back to live in Mexico. Hi there, this is Fei Wu and you are listening to the Face World Podcast. Joining me today is Helena Escalante, writer behind the blog entregurus.com that brings you one idea every day from the greatest entrepreneurship gurus that you can read in under five minutes. You started your business, and which is a connection to Mexico still. Uh, when did you start the business and why did you choose to do that? Well, I started in 2010. There was not a reason why. I always wanted to start a business. I was always very entrepreneurial on the side when I had different jobs. Let's say my professional life when I was an employee, it was always focused on marketing, public relations, advertising international relations and international trade. So if you combine that, I always saw each one of those as a separate one until I got this lightning moment that put all those dots together, that connected all those dots and said, yes, I can definitely do that. And that light bulb moment, I think, came because I, just like many other people that start their businesses, I had the boss from hell and we were not getting along. In a As I look back, it was a blessing in disguise, but at the moment it was so hard. It was so, so hard, but I'm so glad that I leapt into it. And I started the business that took many iterations to what it is today, but I am still loving it, enjoying it and meeting new people, being able to transmit messages from one language to another in a way that brings them results, in a way that gets them what it is that they want to transmit with that message, and in a way that enables me to help touch hearts and move lives. So if, if in case somebody listening need a translation service, and in particular for Spanish and English, what are some types of service offerings at a high level that you would, or project that would interest you, or you would typically take on for your company? Well, I will be more than happy to talk to, again, to the client on whatever their needs are. We do not do translations of, let's just say, a school transcript or something like that. We take on larger projects and larger projects that have something or other to do, again, with marketing, with public relations, with advertising. So that's where our niche is and where we want to continue to be. So if you have something that needs promoting, if you have a website that needs translation, if you have a campaign, if you have a podcast, if you have some sort of industrial audio recording that needs to be translated it or even recorded. I, I've been lucky enough, for instance, one of the most fun projects that I've done is I was the voice in Spanish for a chain of hospitals in Texas. So it, that, that was very fun because we kept joking about it uh, when, when we were going over. Of course, if you are, if this is an emergency, dial 911. But of course, after that came all sorts of you know fun and jokes, as you can only imagine. But all those projects that are industrial or commercial and that 
really target a specific sector of the population, a specific uh, ethnicity, we can do that. And we can do it in up to 100 languages. So whereas I obviously speak English and Spanish, but I definitely coordinate all these other languages. So that's, it's a language is not a problem, or we can even find someone who can do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like working with contractors or subcontractors can be tricky. And I would love to learn from you what are some of the things if people are starting their own business, like you said, like there are things I immediately, I'm still learning for myself. What is it like to hire, actually hire someone who may be a friend or maybe a colleague? What are some of the things that, you know, watch outs or the things that you recommend when hiring a subcontractor? What are some of the quality that you look for? Because all of a sudden, uh, you know, you're not yourself and your company represents, you know, all these staff so that who are supporting what you do. Absolutely. There, there's so much that I can tell you about this. The first, probably the very first thing that comes to mind is you have to hire people that will produce the quality job, the quality of work that you promise. So it's not just hiring someone out of an ad. It's really testing prior to. And it, there are many different ways of testing, of course, and we can definitely have that conversation for another day. But another thing that comes to mind is that you have to be very clear on what is accepted and what, what you will take and what you won't. In my cases, for example, I need people who can deliver on a specific date because usually the client wants to work for yesterday or the week before. So they're always in a rush. And I also have to be very clear with these, uh, with my contractors and say, well, can you absolutely have it by a certain date? And they do, certainly. So that you know that you can count on them for that. And they also know that you can count on, on you to pay them on time. So that's, that's something important, meaning you treat them well and they will treat you well. Another thing that to me is incredibly important, this is probably the most important thing, and really it comes down to soft skills, is the ability to talk to them openly and have a very professional relationship. And when you're in a, when you're in a family business like I am, sometimes I hire my sister or I hire someone, but we we somehow change hats and we stop being sisters. We of course you'll never stop being sisters. I love her. Uh, so, but my point is, she puts on her professional hat and I do too. And during that conversation, all we're doing is we're talking about business. And she gets paid. I get invoiced. She. So my point is, you have even with people that are friends when you mention it, or people that you are close to in some other form or fashion or someone that does, uh, you know, whatever work you need to hire and they are in your church or in your circle somehow. So when there is this other connection that goes beyond professional, you have to still put on your hat of, I am a professional and this is going to be a conversation about business. So to put that into a little box where, you know, this is it. And then we can talk about chocolate chip cookies elsewhere at another time, but just keep it very, very professional. That's such great advice because, you know, I'm sure you were experiencing that for the first time when you started your business in 2010, your relationship with the people around you changes. And it's something that I'm sort of the, I'm going through right now because I don't want to have those conversations with my friends or people I know who have worked really well with me. And also I, one of the things I find interesting is because you are the principal too. It's not just you are working either with your sister or with someone else as friends, as partners, right? It's 50-50, but you are the face and the brand of your company, which gives you the authority and making you the principal who is responsible for everything. And having some of those conversations can be really hard if someone you who are friends with you who didn't deliver or if they want complete creative control and they feel that, for example, you need to be co-branded or things like that. Have you run into any of those issues in the past? I mean, I know it doesn't, it's not directly related to translation, but if somebody- Not really, but there is the issue sometimes of credit. For instance, when you're translating 
a book, it would be very nice to give credit to the translator. So I always ask for them because they are somewhat removed, right? So someone comes to me, says, can you please translate this? So in those instances, and even in my contracts, it is spelled out that in the in a few instances where the work is not confidential, we will kindly ask if they will allow, you know, whatever the work to have credit to the translator so that they can add that to their portfolio. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because what intrigued me is now living in the more of an entrepreneurial world. I'm building part of my business slightly differently in 2018, partly inspired by you when you said, Faye, during one of the mastermind groups, you said, what if you could duplicate yourself? Or what if you could hire someone to do things that you can't do, but is could be part of your core um, business offering? So I feel like there are all these little gems in your head. It's not just one, but all these things that that goes on and all the things that you read, uh, all the ideas that you have, it makes me wonder now that people who are listening are clear that you're not just sitting at home, you're running a business full on. And and then now you're running a blog, you're starting a podcast. Could you tell me what kind of triggered this second wave of your creativity or your creative endeavor in a way to write, to record, to interview people. And and gosh, there are so many other projects that I learned through your conversation with Seth Godin as well, that, um, you know, you conduct all of these interviews and you, you really work. You spend a lot of time working for, I believe, the New York Public Library. And so th- how did all this come together? What was it like to take on everything? Well, that is the next part of the story. We were living in Texas, right? So far, so good. And I was running my business from there. Then my husband's company relocated him to New York. That's how we ended up here. And it was, it's been the most joyful and fantastic ride. However, they gave him two weeks. So he came in those two weeks and I came obviously much later, about a month, month and a half later. But what that meant for my clients was that I could definitely bring some of them and continue with servicing them. And that also meant that I could not continue servicing others simply because the work that I was doing for them was very, very localized. So I had to, unfortunately, let those clients go. But of course, I I got them in touch with some of my friends. So I put them in touch with a professional who can continue with the work. So that was not a problem, some of my colleagues. Uh, But once in New York, I found myself knowing nobody and trying to start anew somewhat the business and really wanting to connect and establish my uh, a new network in here so once that happened i thought okay what what do i need to do how do i connect how do i meet like minded people and i started attending meetups and all sorts of entrepreneurial events that I could hear that were happening. So I started connecting, connecting, connecting. And along the path somewhere, somehow, I stumbled upon this fantastic place, which is the business library, which is part of the New York Public Library system. But it's a library dedicated to business. Actually, the name is Science, Industry, and Business Library. Never heard of it. It's a, well, when you come to New York, I'll be more than happy to give you a tour. And I will be happy, happy, happy to open that invitation to any of your listeners that are in New York. It is a fantastic place. And if you want to learn anything about business, you just go there and all the resources are at your disposal at no cost. It is, again, I cannot say enough good things about this. So I was at the library. And I would like what they do in terms of programming so much that I would be coming back and back and back whenever they had something that I enjoyed. It so happened that, as you know me, I'm very vocal and I make friends easily. So I was sitting and then I turned to the person next to me to say, I can't believe the quality of the programs that you have in here. This is absolutely fantastic. How long have you been coming here? And the person starts laughing and says, oh, I happen to be the assistant director. Thank you so much for telling me that you like them. So 
I introduced myself and we somehow became friends and acquainted ourselves, right? And I said, oh, well, I'm so glad to make a new friend. I was actually wondering if you do these programs in Spanish just as out of curiosity. And she said, you know, we would love to do it, but we have nobody that could teach entrepreneurship and we don't know anybody that could do it in Spanish and we don't know, you know, all of these things. And I said, well, I have a little bit of time in my hands and how about I do that for you? I mean, put me to the test. I will be more than happy to do it as a volunteer, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, they took me up on my offer and I started giving a few different programs here and there. And then I started servicing the library as with their needs. So we did work for them in Russian, in, in Spanish, of course, in Chinese, in, in many different languages. Wow, I can't how many remember. years so ago anyway, was this? That was when I first got to New York, or I mean, roughly, shortly thereafter. So no, this is, uh, we've been here for five years. So that was about five years ago. Long story short, they started hiring me for these little things and projects that they had here and there for me to go represent them and speak on radio or TV about the library here in English and Spanish there. And after a short while, maybe, maybe a year or so, they issued a request for proposals for the kind of work that I did. And they said, hey, we've got this RFP out. Would you like to bid? And I said, oh, of course I would. And so I submitted my bid and I lost. And I was so, so upset. I was so disappointed because I really, really wanted that contract. And also not only because I love the library, but also because it was a great way to prove to other clients that I, that even though I am somewhat new in New York, I can provide a quality service for someone like, for an institution of the caliber of the New York Public Library. So anyway, I was very, I was very upset. I was very disappointed. And I said, okay, well, so let's move on. So I continued and thereafter, I don't know, maybe six months, eight months, at some point thereafter came out another request for proposals. And I said, I don't care what happens, but I am going to win this RFP no matter what. And at that point, my network was not so big in New York because they were requesting a New York based team. And Believe me, I still to this day don't know how I did it, but I was able <laughs> to assemble this incredible team that could service what they needed, which how was- How many people? A, a pro, uh, we were probably, if I remember correctly, about eight or 10. Oh, that's to, still to be a able, short period of time, yeah. Yeah, so to be able to service 11 branches of of the library system on this one particular program that they had in Spanish and in Chinese. So finally, the day comes, I submit the RFP, you know, give it a blessing and cross my fingers. And I did not hear anything for maybe a month or so. And I, I and I just gave it up. You know, I thought, you know, there's unfortunately probably missed it, you know, probably lost it again. So, oh, well, keep going. And then I got a call. And it was the gentleman for purchasing to let me know that I had won the bid, a three-year contract with the New York Public Library. And this was five and years ago. I was, and yeah. I was ecstatic. Actually, this was, no, this, this was afterwards. This was much afterwards because that contract was ending in December of last year. So, so that must have been you know, not definitely not the first year or the second one that we were in, but again, shortly thereafter. So I was ecstatic. So I started working on this program and then they called me from the library and said, Hey, would you help us on doing this one particular thing? But this was just in English. And can you help us with this and that? And so anyway, my work with the public library has changed in the sense that I no longer do too many things in different languages. But what I definitely do for them, which is something that I love, is put together programs for the entrepreneurial community in New York so that they can come and learn about anything and everything related to 
starting or running or growing a business. So I bring in different people, different authorities, the different subject matter experts on a weekly basis so that they can learn about that. Then we started a program called the CEO series that enables anybody to come and sit down and listen to a renowned author who is also a CEO of a small business, such as Seth Godin, such as Marie Forleo, such as Chris Gillibo, such as, well, I mean, so many that we've had that it's been fantastic because with my love of reading, I've always read a lot and I'll tell you how that started. But with my love of reading, I've been able to reach out to all of these authors and say, hey, would you mind coming in and talking about this book and addressing this one particular issue? So that has also worked out. And that leads me then to this other part of the story, which is my love of books. When I started my job, I realized that I was very good at what I do, right? Translation, the international uh, relations part, the the transcreation part of it. So all of these things I was very good at, but there were other parts of running a business that I had no clue and I was failing and I was failing very fast. So I knew that I needed mentors and mentors came in the form of course of wonderful people, but you cannot always have them right next to you to ask them questions. You know, they have families, they have businesses to run, they have all of these things. So sometimes I needed an answer and I needed it fast and it had to be very specific. So I started reading all of these business books. I've always been a bookworm, but I would read fiction. I would read psychology. I would read lots of different things, but not necessarily business. But my focus on business books started again shortly after I started my business. And I simply fell in love with them because they're so actionable and they gave me so many great ideas. And more than anything, I guess I just love getting those aha moments that that you can't resist and that prompt you into action of a particular thing. Because when you get, I'm sure that you've had just this one very powerful idea that you get in your mind that you can't stop. You have, on the contrary, you have to stop everything else to go and devote your time to doing that because it's so good and you just love it. So I love when that happens to me. And I wanted to share that with friends and family. So I started sharing here and there. And as a result of that, some friends or some family members started saying, oh my God, this was fantastic. Look, you recommended this book. And then I did this and this and this and this. It is I, The only thing that I did was simply recommend a book. It is all their merit, but I could not believe the power that ideas had. And as part also of my work with the business library and being able to help all of these hundreds by now of business people, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, I have been able to share that those ideas, that love of books with them. And I have seen what they are able to do once you put a resource in their hands, even, even if that resource is just an idea. So as part of that, I wanted to do something that would enable me to serve more people, to share, again, this love of books and love of ideas with other people who can benefit from it. And that's how Entre Gurus was born. Entre Gurus for the readers is my blog, which gives you one idea every day from the top entrepreneurship gurus books. And you can read that in less than five minutes. Mm hmm. Wow, like this, all the stories kind of come full circle here, getting the gig and the love for books and then coming full circle to starting this blog. Also, I have a little gift for your audience because I love you and I want to extend this to your audience. Um, I've created a page, which is entregurus.com forward slash face world. In there, you will find just a, a one uh, a little survey because I want them to tell me what it is that they are struggling with, what that most pressing issue is. And I will be happy to recommend that, you know, a book or a resource that can help them out. And also for the first three that sign up, I will send them this book, which is 
show your work because your podcast is for the unsung heroes, right? For everyday heroes who are making a difference. And I think the one thing that makes us all an everyday hero is that we're doing it constantly. But if we could only show it to more people, more people would benefit and more people would derive the value that we are providing. So I really want them to show their work. And this is a fantastic book. It's Show Your Work by Austin Kleon. Yeah, I love that book. I also have the one before that it has a black cover with a yellow writing. Yeah, show, I forgot. Stealing, steal like an artist. I love that one. It's a fantastic book. I love it too. Thank you so much, Helena. That was was great and pouring your heart out and sharing your stories from start to finish. And I'm hearing so much of that for the first time, at least cohesively versus just a quick, you know, snippet or a snapshot. Exactly. Now all the dots are connected. Um, thank you so much for joining the show and offering the gift. Um, how do people find you and connect with you? Well, thank you. I am of course, this is pun intended. I am an open book. So <laughs> they can find me online at entregurus.com. And that is a blend of entrepreneurship and gurus. So E-N-T-R-E-G-U-R-U-S.com. So that's the website for the blog. And if you want to write to me directly, my email is Helena, H-E-L-E-N-A, at entregurus.com. And I will be delighted, absolutely delighted to hear from you. Awesome. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you. Now. Hi there, it's me again. I want to thank you very much for listening to this episode. And I hope you were able to learn a few things. If you enjoy what you heard, it will be hugely helpful if you could subscribe to the Face Royal podcast. It literally takes seconds. If you're on your mobile phone, just search for Face Royal podcast in the podcast app on iPhone or an Android app such as Podcast Addict and click subscribe. All new episodes will be delivered to you automatically. Thanks so much for your support.